Now, Father, as we explore deeper revelation of your truths, may they cause us to know you more, love you more richly and more deeply. Anoint my thoughts and strengthen my body. Anoint your people's ears. Anoint their eyes. Change us all by the power of your word, which is a promise that it will not return void. Now we stand upon that promise. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen and amen. God bless you, church. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 10, beginning at verse 3. 2 Corinthians 10, beginning at verse 3. Going to pick up where we left off, declaring war on Satan's war. Know your enemy. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal of man-made devices, but are mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. A little boy climbed up on a chair and he started eating cookies off of the kitchen counter. His mother had told him earlier, don't mess with those cookies, boy. Surprising him, she entered the room and she asked, what are you doing? I told you don't eat those cookies. With a full mouth, the boy replied, Mama, you just don't understand. I got up here on this chair and my teeth got caught. <laughs> Isn't it the way the enemy works? To encourage us to disobey those that have authority in our lives and no more so than to disobey the authority of God in our lives. And we know that we have an enemy and he has many names. Each one exposing his character. But the one that really stands out most to me is the one called the thief, the original kleptomaniac. John said in 10, Jesus said in John 10 and 10 that he comes first to steal everything he can out of your life. But I want you to get something in your spirit this morning, church, that you need to really comprehend is that everything is not about thievery ultimately. The ultimate goal of the enemy, though he comes in through the door of theft, is to kill and destroy. Jesus said he's come to kill and destroy. Let me give you another name for the enemy that we don't hear often. It's not in your notes, but please write this name down. It is Abaddon, spelled A-B-A-D-D-O-N, Abaddon. The name Abaddon literally means the one who brings destruction. Listen to me closely. The enemy of your soul, as I've told you so often, he has not come to give you a bad day, a bad week, a bad month, a bad year. He has not even come to give you a bad life. His ultimate goal is to destroy and to kill you. And I want to give you two ways that the enemy sets us up for destruction. And I want you to understand that the devil never ever destroys your life without making you a part of that destruction. Let me show you the first way that he does it. He does it by causing you to become lazy and apathetic in your walk with God. I'm talking about becoming lukewarm. How many of you remember the day that you got saved? Let me tell you what I know about the day when we got saved. We were all on fire. We were going to burn for Jesus. And some of us have allowed the enemy to burn us out. We are no longer on fire. We are lukewarm. And the moment that you become lukewarm, be sure that compromise is just around the corner. And church, remember this. When compromise turns the corner... Things that once were wrong to us now suddenly become right. Things that we would never do, we now justify. He will make you believe, church, that you can make a pet out of sin. And even you'll try to get away with some things that you don't believe anybody else can get away with. But you think that you're the exception to the rule. That's how the enemy will mesmerize you. I've seen this happen thousands of times. The Memphis Commercial Appeal carried a news dispatch. It told of a man who was across the river in Arkansas who had a pet rattlesnake. The man found the snake as a baby. He took it, he fed it, he made a pet out of it. The reptile would come when he whistled. It would eat from his fingers. It would coil around his arm and let him stroke his head with the palm of his hand or with the tips of his fingers. And one day he decided, I'm going to take my pet snake in and entertain my friends. They sat there and they watched and they marveled at his gentleness. They marveled at the way that it coiled itself with apparent tenderness around his arm. They marveled at how it would come literally when he whistled. They marveled that it would eat from his hand. 
After he had satisfied himself that he had impressed his friends, the man went back home with his pet snake. When he arrived home suddenly, without the slightest provocation, that reptile became angry. And quicker than a zigzag lightning bolt flashes from the bosom of a dark cloud, that pet rattler buried its fangs in the man's arms. A few hours later, the man was dead. One quick instant, through that friendly serpent's poisonous fangs, that man met death. Now stop right there and let me say something to you. The devil, again, I tell you, never presents you something ugly. He always presents something beautiful, and it looks like it's, it's right for you. Please get this in your spirit. It is very true that everything that glitters is not gold. Two days after that, this man, who should have been sitting with his family in their humble, happy home, he was sleeping in the mud of an Arkansas grave. Listen to what Robert G. Lee says about this account. With such dread cometh such an hour to every man and woman who makes a pet of sin. So cometh the such an hour and death to every man who refuses when God calls. Let me tell you what hit my spirit yesterday when I was working on this message. It really began to resonate in my spirit that God has a word for us here today. God has a word for us in this room for the saved and the unsaved. God is saying to the unsaved, you don't have to die in your sin today. There is a redeemer who has died to set you free and the enemy does not have to destroy your life. God is saying to others in this room that God has been chasing you. He's been trying to convict you of sin in your life. The hound of heaven has been chasing after you and he's trying to get you to repent and to turn away from that sin that you've made a pet of and the Lord said to tell somebody in this room he said let them know today do it today before it destroys your life and some of you you have been getting mad oh bishop he preaches such a hard sermon let me tell you why I preach the way I do Sunday January 26 2020 we left this church, and I want you to know my spirit was high. God was moving by his spirit. Great things happened in that service. And we stopped to get dinner, and we took it home. And let me tell you what I said that day. I said, baby, I'm going into Kentucky Fried Chicken. I have a gift card. This is going to be my last Kentucky Fried Chicken meal. I changed into my jammies, took my Kentucky Fried Chicken meal downstairs to the bat cave. Sat down in my chair, turned on the TV to enjoy an afternoon filled with basketball. And as I tuned in, I lost my appetite. I have always had three favorite basketball players, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, and Kobe Bryant. My jaw dropped to the ground when I realized the tragic accident that took this young man, not only his life, but took him away from his wife and his other daughters. And took his one daughter with him. Only a few days later, my wife and I would learn that our friends, their daughter, she succumbed to cancer. But thank God she was a Christian and she really didn't lose the battle to cancer. She won the battle for to die as gain and to be with Christ. But I said all that to say to you this morning, church. I said, Lady Brenda, this is why I preach the way that I preach. Because life is hard enough without us aiding the devil in trying to destroy our lives by living lives of compromise and putting ourselves in situations where he can destroy us if we don't heed our ways. Let me go on to quote Robert G. Lee. He said, an hour of kindred terror narrates the man or the woman who refuses to respond when God stretches out his hand. A day of dreaded despair just like that man met when he pulled that pet snake's fangs from his arm and hurled it to the ground is out yonder somewhere to all who set at naught God's counsel and ignore reproof. The Holy Spirit says, tell somebody today, Galatians 6 and 7, please never ever forget that God is not mocked. Somebody needs to hear the Holy Spirit. Somebody needs to hear the reproof of the Holy Ghost. There is a danger, church, in death and delay. Before you exit this place today, hear the Holy Spirit. Whoever God is speaking to today, let go of that thing. Let it go and let it go now. You see, the evil one will somehow convince you just enjoy the sin for a while. Listen to me. That's why I preach the way I do. I am tired of the devil destroying and deceiving God's kids. You see, deceit always precedes destruction. Let me tell you a second way that the devil gets you to participate in your destruction. He does it by blinding the eyes of God's children spiritually. It's called stealing the ability of discernment. Now remember a few weeks ago I said that your authority over the enemy is released through a life of holiness. Let me take it a step farther. You cannot see the things of God clearly with a life that is clouded with sin. For it is also released through a life of holiness. 
And Abaddon is destroying more Christians' lives because they do not hear clearly and they do not see clearly in the spirit realm because their eyes are clouded by sin. Listen to me, church. There are preachers who will make you think that God will only speak to you through them. I want you to understand that God in these last days is wanting to speak directly to you, but you cannot hear his voice. You cannot see those things that he wants you to see as long as your life is clouded with sin. Let me say it again. It is time for the church of Jesus Christ to once again become established in the holiness of God so that we can live where the devil can't touch us. Let me paint you a picture of what is happening at this present hour in the realms of the discernment and spiritual eyesight when it comes to most Christians. There is this haunting photo by Alan Keller in the 1993 issue of Life magazine. It is the picture of a boy playing a flute. The boy named Jensen is only 10 years old in that picture, but probably could play some of the very saddest songs you would ever hear. For when you look at his eyes or where his eyes should be beneath the long, dark bangs, you see only redness and empty sockets. Jensen lives in a charitable institution in Bogota, Colombia. Blindness is always tragic, but the, the cause of blindness in this case only multiplies the sorrow. The caption next to the photo, Robert Sullivan explains that the boy was most likely a victim of organ nappers, eye thieves. When Jensen was 10 years old, reports of his mother says that she took him to a hospital because he had acute diarrhea. The next day when she returned, bandages covered Jensen's eyes. Dried blood was spattered all over his body. Horrified, she asked the doctor what had happened. He answered harshly, you can't see that your son is dying? And then he dismissed her. She rushed Jensen to another hospital in Bogota. After examining him, the doctor gave chilling news. He said, they have stolen his eyes. Jensen is somewhat fortunate he's alive. The organ traffickers usually kill their victims, excise their body parts, and broker them to a shoe willing to pay for healthy kidney or cornea transplants. Listen to me, church. Get this in your spirit. Organ thieves in Bogota, Colombia are not the only ones stealing people's eyes. There is an enemy of your soul called the devil who is stealing the eyes of spiritual people day after day after day. We are in a day and age in the church of Jesus Christ with all that is going on around us, all the struggle, all the strife, all the things that are happening. That if the enemy will steal anything from you, it is your ability to look over in the spirit realm and to be able to see what God is doing in this hour. Now listen to me. I want to go back to what Jesus said in John 21, 26a. He said, if we don't guard our hearts, many, 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 many people's hearts are going to fail in these last days. Many are going to be overcome by fear. But I believe that we don't have to be a part of the heart failure group. I believe that the church of Jesus Christ can have strong, firm hearts even in these last days, no matter how difficult times get. If, listen to me now, we will avail ourselves of the dynamic weapons of our warfare that God has given to us. And I want to share with you just a couple today. Let me just say that the one that I start with, you're going to try and blow me off. Let me tell you why. Because in our minds, we have made it just a church activity and not a weapon of warfare. But before I go there, let me say something very important. One pastor was called to an emergency house, emergency at the house next door to his parents. The house had been ravaged and windows broken and furniture capsized and drawers pulled out and mirrors broken and beds turned upside down and clothing and other things were thrown out in the middle of the floor and later the pastor learned that a 15 year old boy high on crack cocaine had kicked in the window and spent several days living in the house. When the police arrived on the scene, the boy ran out of the home across a field, jumped into a filthy, dirty, putrid swamp filled with stagnant water with green algae floating all over the top. Yet that boy deliberately jumped into that swamp. As the police pulled him out, he began to scream and kick, cursing like the pastor had never heard before. He said that boy said words of profanity that I didn't even know existed. He began a deluge out of that 15-year-old boy's mouth. His words were far dirtier than the swamp water. Shocked and amazed by the scene, the pastor asked the officer, who was a good friend of his, he said, tell me something. How does a good person end up in this pathetic condition in just 15 years on this planet? The officer looked at him and he made this statement. He said, pastor, he didn't get that way overnight. This is the first lesson I want you to learn from this that I'm sharing with you. We don't fall into Satan's snares and into sin overnight. 
He progressively lures us, slowly getting us to compromise over here, compromise over here, compromise over here. And he'll make you think that a little compromise is okay. But what you don't understand, church, is that a little compromise always leads to a larger compromise. Because every time you compromise, you got to compromise again to cover up the compromise that you said you would never compromise. Listen to me now. When they placed that young man in that police, cl police cruiser, he beat his head against the inside of the vehicle but until blood was running down his face. He screamed and he kicked like a wild man. They cuffed his hands in front of him. Yet somehow he managed to raise them over his back, get them behind him, cutting his arms in several places. His hands were bleeding while the police were trying to calm him down. Listen to me, church. There came a call over the police cruiser radio system that there had been an accident. Another cruiser, which had been called to the same site, was involved in an accident. They were driving at a high rate of speed. There was a 15-year-old who's causing disturbance while as the cruiser sped down the highway, there was a car in front of them full of teenagers and their driving instructor. The student driver saw the lights behind him and he panicked, trying to pull out of the way. The young driver thought the police were going to the right, but they swerved back to the left and the police cruiser crashed into the side of the driver's ed car. Three people died. This newly captured boy had no idea what had happened. Instead, he was only concerned about his own welfare. He looked in the eyes of that arresting officer and he asked, why don't you just go ahead and release me? I'm a juvenile and you know they're going to let me go anywhere. Anyway, the police officer ignored him, delivered him to the juvenile authorities. Listen now, in less than three hours, that youngster was released on his own recognizance. This nagging thought stirred the pastor's heart after this incident. He said a 15-year-old boy thought that he was out for a joy ride and would get away with it. He said if only someone had taught him this timeless principle of Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Listen to me, church. That youngster had no earthly idea that three people entered into eternity, two of them 16-year-olds who would never see their 17th birthday as a result of rebellion. What was the root cause of that destruction? It was sin, a highly infectious communicable disease. So let me say one more time, lesson number two from this account. Church, get this in your spirit. The wages of sin have not gone up, nor have they gone down for thousands of years. Wages of sin is an equal opportunity employer. It pays the same wage for Christians as non-Christians. The wages of sin is still death. I have had Christians say to me, don't preach on sin. That's an old-fashioned theory. I am here to tell you that it's not just an old-fashioned theory. That since Adam and Eve fell in the garden, sin started paying its wages. And it has not let up. It still pays the same wage in 2020. And you have an evil one who is bent on destroying your life. I want you to put your hand on somebody's shoulder and say, wake up and listen to the Holy Ghost. But you and I, we don't have to be employed by sin if we don't want to. Let me tell you what I know. The evil one is not going to let up on you just because you're a Christian. He's not going to let up on you just because you're serving in ministry, just because you give tithes and offerings. The evil one is not going to let up on me just because I carry the title of pastor and bishop. You and I are engaged in a war that will rage on until Jesus comes or until you go to see him. And Paul tells us, church, we have some weapons of our warfare at our disposal. They are not man-made. They are mighty in God and able to destroy strongholds. And it's interesting because the word mighty is literally the Greek word hippo which literally means a dynamic which literally transforms into able to completely and utterly destroy the Bible says that God has given us some weapons of our warfare that when the enemy comes in like a flood he will raise up a standard against him and we can literally utterly destroy the works of Satan Jesus said that's why I was manifested that I might destroy the works of Satan and then Jesus made this statement he says as I I and the Father are one. You and I are one. And as I am in him, you are the same in me. Listen to me, church. Isaiah 54, 17 didn't say that the weapon would not form. But it said that when it forms, it shall not prosper. If you will engage the dynamic weapons of your warfare. 
Touch somebody and say, you got no business losing. Now watch. I'm going to give you this first dynamic weapon. And I'm going to tell you right now. Don't look at me and go, really? Because let me tell you what I know. This one, we think nothing of. We don't even view it as a weapon of warfare. I'm going to say it again. We just believe it and, and view it as something that we do as a Christian activity. The first weapon of your warfare is the dynamic weapon of unity. Now, stay with me because I'm going to build something here. Resist the temptation. We all know that Psalm 133 says that that is where God commands favor and blessing upon the lives of those that dwell together in unity. In Matthew 18, 19 through 20, Jesus said this. He said, where two or more get together in a room and they sit down and they agree upon anything. Everybody say anything. He said that when they agree upon anything, when they are in unity, I walk into the room. I sit down right in the middle of the conversation and I listen to what they're saying. And when they come into agreement and they're on the same page, he says they'll Tell me, I'll tell the Father, and the Father will do it. Let me tell you something, though. We've got to understand that true unity is about more than you not being a disruptive, divisive force. True unity surely is where the people have one vision, one voice, and one victory. But let me tell you something. True unity goes deeper than that. Listen to me closely. True unity goes from merely being one person in the body of Christ to becoming connected to the body of believers. Now stay with me, because this seems simplistic, but we just don't get it. The reason the early church was so impressive, strong, and successful was not simply because they were sitting up in a room saying the same thing, Singing the same songs. Talking the same talk. And believing for the same thing. I know that's what we've been told, but it's not true. There was blessing and favor. Watch this now. There was blessing and favor on their lives because they were connected. Now, now, now stay with me. Listen to Acts 3, 42 through 46. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Listen now. And fellowship in the breaking of bread, in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. Everybody say common. And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I hope you hear what that scripture literally said. They weren't simply in the building. They were connected to one another. And because they were connected, no one went without. I just, the devil doesn't care how many times you come into the building as long as you do not connect with the people in the building. I'm trying to help somebody because, see, here's the reason why we keep getting whipped 50 ways from Sunday. Watch now. I'm talking about the church. The devil doesn't care when you respond and somebody says, where do you attend church? And you say, Eagle Heights Cathedral, that's my church. Listen to me. The devil doesn't care that you say that as long as you don't connect to the church. Because watch me now. Isolation is the devil's M.O. Watch what happens. Peter says to Christ, Lord, I will never deny that I know you. Jesus says, before the cock crows three times, you will deny that you knew me. Peter said, no, 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 I'll never do that, Lord. 
But what Peter forgot was that God, Jesus said to him, the devil is setting you up. He has come to me. He has asked me to be able to isolate you, to separate you from the rest of the disciples so that he might destroy you. But then Jesus says, but don't worry about it, Pete. I got you covered. I have prayed for you. I'm protecting you. I am with you. And so he won't be able to destroy you. Now, why did Jesus say to Peter, be careful. The devil wants to isolate you. Because listen to me very closely. When you go into isolation, church, please understand this. What drove him to isolation? It was a tragic event. He went through some stuff. What the devil wants to do is when you go through some stuff, get you to isolate yourself because what the devil knows is that if you isolate yourself, you lose all of the help that you have around you to help you make it through the storm. Let me tell you something right now, church. That is what the devil loves about many in the kingdom of God because we're so isolated. You see, you can be in the church and still be isolated. 